Why did you get into journalism? Curiosity. Why did you get into it? You. Ladies and gentlemen, I give you my friend, Dan Rather. I'm the producer. I put the team together. We have Lucy Scott to run point. Colonel Roger Charles worked Abu Ghraib for us. Mike Smith he was a researcher for us back in 2000. What's our next move? I might have something for the election. The president of the United States may have gone AWOL from the military. He never even showed up. Those parts of his file they didn't like, they tossed in a wastebasket. Do you have these documents? These really are the holy grail of documents. You've got three hours. We're out of time. Start out, buddy. Go! Go, 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 go! Tonight, we have new information on the president's military service. Here's to a great story. Hey, Mary. These blogs are saying that the memos can be recreated in Microsoft Word. Several experts have raised serious questions. They're gonna start an investigation. This is bad. They do not get to do this. They do not get to smack us just for asking the question. They wanna to talk to your source. No. It's bad. I never should have asked a question. You gotta make your case, honey. You have to fight. Somebody has got to confirm those memos. This isn't a trial. This is a hunt. What we are talking about is you bringing your politics into your report. I did nothing of the kind. Where does politics not enter into this? Our story was about whether the president fulfilled his service. Nobody wants to talk about that. They want to talk about fonts and forgeries. And they hope to God the truth gets lost in the scrum. That reception tells you uh, we have a fantastic panel here. <laughs> this is an amazing group of uh, performers and, of course, one of the great journalists of our generation here. So we're great privilege. It's a privilege for me and also interesting for me because uh, I was uh, covering this story when it happened. So when I watched this movie, <laughs> I was particularly drawn in to all the details that I remembered and some that we didn't know were happening, which was always fascinating to see. And I guess the, the thing I... I I'm curious about is the folks who were not involved, which would be Kate and, and Bob, uh, and of course James, uh, were you following this story? When it was going on, were you in, in any way aware of all these things that were happening in CBS? Kate? Well, I'm, I'm not from this country, I'm from Australia, and I think the, one of the interesting things for me is that yes, I was aware of, of the Bush Guard story, but what got more international traction, and perhaps the story that stayed around longer, was the Kerry Swift boat stuff. And so I've been interested subsequently why that stuff uh, swam and the right. Bush Guard story sunk. Right. Mm -hmm. Were you? Uh, I, I was uh, sort of aware of it. Uh, I was filming at the time. What I remember about it was that it was an open and shut case, that you didn't have time to really know what the real story was because it got shut down so quick, which left a kind of a feeling about something's wrong here, something's missing, but you didn't have time or you didn't have the ability to find out what it is, was, mm -hmm. until now. So mm -hmm. the, the pleasure of being a part of this, of this project was being part of a story that never got told that should have been told. Mm -hmm. That's how I feel. And James, what about you? you, you I know you, you wound up grabbing on the rights of the book as soon as you could. So you must have been fascinated with the tale. I was, yeah. I mean, I was aware of it. I think, I think like most people were, I didn't actually see the initial um, 60 Minutes two-piece when it aired, but I heard about it the next day because it, the, 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 the speed in which it all kind of, you know, exploded and, and, and how it was covered afterwards. So, so I saw it, you know, I mean, it was on, it was top of the news the next day and, and you know, for the next couple of weeks until... Uh, until Dan apologized, it, it, it definitely dominated. So I was aware of it just as somebody who watched the news, but I was never, I wasn't thinking about it uh, as a film uh, at all uh, until uh, I read Mary Mapes' book. Mm -hmm. Well, Dan, you've been involved in so many real life dramas covering so many events. I wonder if you thought in the middle of this, there's a surreal aspect to this that could be a movie. Did that ever strike you? 
Well, there certainly were a lot of surreal aspects to it. Uh, maybe not quite as surreal as this experience when, once a movie is made. This is <laughs> surreal for me to be up here with two of the best actors and actresses in the, of this and any other generation. But in answer to your question, it was certainly surreal. And I, I fault myself, and I think I'd be legitimately faulted, because I didn't soon enough pull back for what we call in television the wide shot and see the entirety of what was happening. What I knew is that we reported a true story and that we were under increasing attack. But when you're in the, in the center, when you're in the vortex of something like that, a movie is among the last things in your mind. <laughs> I would guess. I guess so. I, you know, Dan is such a familiar figure to Americans. Uh, Unlike is, Robert Redford. Uh, well, and, 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 that, and that really sets up an interesting thing, because so are you, obviously. And, and, and I thought you made a lot of interesting choices, because you didn't do an imitation of Dan at all. You, you, you tried to be him, tried to get the essence of him, it seemed to me, without, was that your conscious move? Like, let's, he's too familiar. I'm not going to try to t show people uh, that I can do an impression of Dan, rather. Yes. Uh, I felt that my job as an actor was to get the essence of Dan, but not a caricature of Dan. And if I had gone too far trying to imitate every part of him, it would have ended up being a caricature, which would have hurt the film. So it was a question of getting things like essence, you know, his manner, his style, his dress, which is certainly not my dress. And so uh, so I, 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 get, I tried to get that, and then pull back from going too far in that direction and, and get the essence of him that I remember because I, I watched him on CBS. I mean, he was a knightly figure. Also, Dan and I had, had I don't, this may be getting off the track, but he and I had had an encounter many years ago in the early 70s when he was working for 60 Minutes on an environmental issue out west that was undercover, it was being hidden mm -hmm. by some energy companies and he came out to do the story for 60 Minutes and that's where Dan and I first met. So that was my prior uh, introduction to Dan, but since that time, we did not have that much interaction. Well, it, it was interesting. I, you didn't do, like, I, I would say the folksy kind of things that Dan often does. It was very much, you know, well, Dan is famous for that, and, and, uh, and I think beloved for that, but I think you were hooked into the fact that this was really a very serious and, you know, it, for him, uh, had many implications. So you, it, it seemed to me that's what, what your focus was on, not let's, let's show... Yeah, uh, and, and, you know, uh, Dan is a very decent person. I'm not. And so uh, <laughs> he, he's, he's got a... He's got a I don't want to go too far with it, but I mean, he, he's got a decency and a manner and a style that's almost uncommon. It's very courtly, isn't it? Uh, yeah, yeah, and mm -hmm. I found that really interesting. Yeah. And I'll, Kate... Uh, go ahead. I, mean, yeah. I will say... Yeah. Uh, about whatever anybody thinks about this film, I'm certainly not a film critic, but the roles uh, that Kate and Bob took here and their ability to capture the essence of two of the main characters in the film, and I can speak to Bob's, that others will have to judge how well or poorly I did it, but I always tried to be a pull no punches, play no favorites reporter who was loyal to the people and supported the people with whom he worked. And uh, Bob captured that, that essence, mm -hmm. and I'm very grateful to him for, for doing that in a very difficult role. And also, if I may add, with Mary Mapson, who is, is the central character of this film, is somebody I've known and worked with for a long time. Uh, without question, one of, if not the best investigative television producers of her time. And I'm amazed, still in awe, of how much of a her essence that Kate got that I know things about Mary, things like how she puts her hand to her hair, her, her toughness mixed with her vulnerability, and even fragility. Uh, it's, it's an amazing performance. Well, it is, and I wonder, did you meet Mary? Did you try to get to know her a little bit? Yes, I had the great good fortune. I was on stage here in New York uh, last August, and you know, most films of this tenor, this sort of, uh, the deal with, um, you know, this size budget and um, the, as controversial as the film is, get a long, you know, takes forever to get made, but this got up in a nanosecond. So yeah. we didn't have a lot of time and I, I rang Jamie and said, would Mary meet me? And she's such a go-getter. She was there in 12 hours. So she came to see the play and we sat down and then we Skyped 
um, mm -hmm. a lot, and she was amazingly generous. She's meticulous um, and meticulously organised. So she yeah. presented me with folder upon folder upon folder, <laughs> you know, about what her lounge room, what colour her lounge room was, you know, how she organised her closets. Really? <laughs> you know, she has the, one of the most well-organised handbags of any woman I've ever met, <laughs> which says a lot. Um, yeah. uh, and, uh, but it's just I, asked, I got to ask her a lot of really inane stupid questions because this is in no way a, a, a biopic but yet you have two of the most fascinating interesting intelligent engaged curious um hilarious mary's absolutely hilarious individuals so we tried to i think both of us tried to seed you know all of those character details in there whilst you know telling the freight train that is the story well you've you've played real life people before most of them are dead or most male of them dead. Or, you know, queen, <laughs> queen is dead <laughs> Queen is it's dead. A Catherine Hepburn yes. is dead. But but you also played Bob Dylan, which was kind of interesting. Yeah, so <laughs> not, yeah, perfect not casting dead. for Mary. Yes. I mean. <laughs> and I, I wonder, is it harder to play a real person people sort of know something about? It, it, with, with Catherine Hepburn, I mean, I was terrified because I was playing her in the medium in which she's so iconically known and right. wasn't even playing her in black and white. I was sort of playing her in Technicolor. Um, and you know you can but disappoint. Uh, there was a particular um, challenge that I had, and I don't know whether you felt the same, Bob, but when there's a... Give, given that Mary's side of the story was not heard at the time, um, I felt a very particular personal responsibility to try and sort of rebalance perhaps the, the, um, the ledger, um, but also because Mary is still alive and not well known, um, you know, I, I did feel a personal responsibility, but then you also have to have a lot of creative licence because a film, by its very nature, it's, it's, you know, we don't, it's not a Mahabharata version of the events. You only have a certain amount of time, so certain things get omitted, and, and therefore certain details stand out um, more strongly. So I was very nervous when I, I heard that Dan and Mary were you know, seeing the film for the first time. <laughs> I'm sure. But one of the interesting... You, one of the ways you get into her humanity, it seems to me, is the way she deals with her father, which I think is an unusual thing, and then there's an amazing scene at the end of the movie about yeah. that. And, and I just wondered if that was like important to you to have that sort of human, some humanizing, not just the professional aspect, which is fascinating, but that sort of personal human side. Well, that, the, the relationship with the father was sort of peppered in Mary's book, but also, I mean, that's part of um, Jamie's direction, um, you know, that he began as, you know, as the screenwriter who wrote the play. <laughs> Uh, the, the, the script, where am I, what day is it? Um, and, uh, I mean, it's, you, as an actor, you do put your character on the couch a little bit and you do some amateur psychologising. And you don't want to overplay that stuff because Mary certainly didn't herself. But she did grow up in a violent and hilarious household. And I think that's... Um, and she shares with Dan, if I may say, probably a, a hatred of hypocrisy and of bullies. And that came, you know, to her from a very early age. Well, there is a moment in the movie, I don't want to give it away, but there's a moment that you deliver a line that I think is very telling uh, about her relationship with Dan, but I won't give that away. But uh, James, you, you obviously decided this was a you know, provocative idea to do, I assume, and, and, and your title strikes me as interesting because I wonder, How if, so, I wonder if you're being declarative or provocative there. Truth. It, it, no, it's not coming from a declarative of a place. I, you know, I, I, I love the title because it's, for me, it's the thing that everybody's searching for. Um, and, it's, and it's elusive, it's tricky to find, and, you know, I mean, in, in this case, certainly, I mean, whole careers are, are, are changed, or in, in some cases ended, um, just by going after it. But it's still, it's still the thing that everybody wants to get to. And it's the thing that's in dispute in the film, um, and, and in, in, in some ways still in real life about the story. Um, but it's the goal. Yeah, so you're not, you're not saying, everybody, this is the truth. This is what really happened. No, well, I think it's, you know, what you do is you try and make a film that's, that's as truthful as possible uh, mm -hmm. to, the, to the events and to the people who experience them. And, you know, you have to tell the story through your protagonist, protagonist's eyes. And, you know, we based the, the, the film on Mary's book and did a lot of research and spoke to a lot of different people who were involved in it or were around the story at the time, both on and off the record. And you try and get all of that information together and hear as many different, you know, versions and viewpoints on it. And then at the end of the day, you have to go away and make your film and, and, and tell this, the emotional story that the characters went through. Dan, in, a, in a way, yeah. I mean, truth is subjective, um, but facts are immutable. And, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, I think it's the difference between perhaps yeah. those two things. Well, that's interesting. So how factual is the movie, Dan, from your point of view? Well, I think the movie took 
maybe six years to do. I'm not quite sure how long it was. But in the beginning, I, I didn't think the movie could get made. Uh, when Jamie and Brad Fisher, the producer, came and talked to me about optioning uh, Mary's book and saying they wanted to make a film, um, I, I nodded and said, well, that would be nice. But I was thinking to myself that probably I'm more likely to become the Pope of Rome and there is to get, for, this, for this movie to actually get made. There's still time. <laughs> <laughs> but Bill, I will say about this film, and I recognize that many, if not most, of the people in the audience have not seen the film. The film is, to one degree, is about Mary Mapes and what happened to her and myself and former President George W. Bush. But the overarching thing about this film and what makes it resonate today, I think, and I think it will resonate with the audiences, is this film is about journalism, political power, and betrayal. It's a, a fascinating film, multi-layered, that is at the intersection of media, very big corporations and their political allies and propaganda. And I think any thinking person today has to say to themselves, what's happened to the news? I mean, the news is different today than it was in years past. What this movie is about is, at base, is what's happened to the news, why it happened, how it happened, and why anybody outside news should care about it. Mm -hmm. Well, Mr. Redford, I think, is quoted saying it's about loyalty. Yes, and there, I, I could speak on two levels here. Dan's covered the one level, which is the higher level, about what it's all about. The intersection, I guess you could call it an intersection, between uh, corporation, uh, media, and um, journalism. Um, that's sort of the high level. I obviously am going to come into this on a different level, and that is as an actor. So I love the story. I knew a little bit about the story. What Jamie did was he dug down deep right into the bones of what this story really was about that nobody got a chance to hear. So I felt I was drawn to the script because he did such a beautiful job to flesh that out. But finally, I'm an actor, and I'm going to be playing somebody that's known, and that's tricky. So my concern was, well, I called Dan early on. I said, hey, Dan, I'm going to be playing you. And uh, is there anything you want to tell me? He said, Bob, uh, it's about loyalty. Mm -hmm. And when I heard that, and I realized that was sort of the end of the sentence, it's about loyalty. I was loyal to Mary. She was loyal to me. And we were loyal to our bosses. And there was sort of a triangle of loyalty in play there, and we maintained our loyalty to each other. But the loyalty to the bosses uh, was, was uh, cut in half, cut away. Mm -hmm. So I thought, well, if I'm going to be playing Dan, then obviously that relationship, which was about loyalty, because he said they were loyal to each other, um, if that's the case, then I'm going to be wanting to know about Mary. Who's going to play Mary? And of course, because Kate can do anything. She's proven that. Mm -hmm. She goes into a role and she absorbs the role so completely that you're with her. So yeah. when I heard that she might be doing it, I said, well, that gives me comfort because she and I are going to have to establish that quality of loyalty. And knowing Kate as I do now, that was not anything that we had to work on. It was just going to be there. And for me, you haven't seen the film, but. For me, it was. Yeah. I'm going to play devil's advocate a little bit here. Um, so the corporate aspect of, of what happened, which I think is sort of comes at toward the end when, when Topher Grace has a speech and says what, what connection that the Viacom has to the administration, um, which I thought was very interesting and kind of came out of left field a little in the movie because you didn't realize that might be a factor at that point. But, you know, I, I, I as a person covering this, I, I had my own feelings of, as it went along, and I thought it was an interesting comparison to me because um, there had been a previous movie about 60 Minutes called The, In, the Insider, right? And in that movie, uh, which was, you know, also about uh, a story that was they were trying to get on the air and CBS got in the middle of keeping it off the air, um, there the corporation decided, because they were maybe up for sale at the time, that they didn't want this story to go out the way it was. In this case, 
they didn't interfere with the story initially. They let the story go on the air, as it's, you guys wanted it to go on the air. It went on the air that way. They didn't know that they would be attacked or there'd be flaws in it or whatever. They'd, and it, if there had not been some way in to attack that story, wouldn't it have stood and CBS would not have been accused of any kind of corporate interference? Well, I'm going to try to answer the question, but with all respect, and I mean this gently, Bill, it, it's one of those questions, like, I don't know, use a Texanism, if a frog had side pockets, he'd carry a handgun. But, but, but of course, he doesn't. That's he doesn't, what I was talking about. Oh, I wish he doesn't have movie. side pockets. No, I wish but, I could put that yeah. in the movie. So it's hypothetical. One will never know. What we do know, what you said is true. They put the story on the air. We'd had dip, great difficulty, as the film will point out, with the previous story on Abba Grave, in which we broke that story. Uh, and they were very reluctant to put it out. But with this story, yes, they did put it out. And in the initial phases, very first days, uh, they stood behind us and banked us, which is in the great history and tradition of CBS News. Right. The corporation may or may not like what you do, but they stand behind you. And this is what was different about this occasion. But when, it, when the Republican powers, including the White House, of whom the corporation was looking for favors, wanting to get additional stations allowed, right. all kinds mm -hmm. of rules, regulations, legislation they wanted passed. When, they, when the powers in Washington began to put the pressure through their lobbyists, and this is what was amazing to me, I didn't learn until later, long after I left CBS News, that the lobbyists came to Viacom, the central company, and said, listen, we've got to do something because the people with whom we're trying to persuade to get this legislation, regulations, and rules through, they've blown a gasket here. And at that point, the corporation caved. Right. You're quite right. In the beginning, they put the piece on the air. Mm -hmm. For a few days, they said, well, okay, we'll back our reporters. Yeah. Once they began to get the, the backwash from Washington, very powerful people in Washington, including the White House, saying, you, you have to retract the story. By the way, we never retracted, we retracted the story. We did apologize for the, for the documents themselves. But at any rate, not to digress, it was only after a few days. First, they reversed themselves and caved and said, they said to the lobbyists, assure them we'll, we'll do whatever is necessary. Then they began to separate themselves from the story. And, Frankly, they started looking for scapegoats, mm -hmm. and uh, they eventually got but, their scapegoats. But it's interesting. I don't think you have a situation like this, and it, I wonder how Kate feels about this, if there weren't flaws. The, the, there were flaws. That's why it's an interesting story. It was not a perfect story. And, and they made the missteps, which may not have actually undermined the truth of the story, were like the avenue in to attack it. And I wondered how when you're playing the character, if that makes her actually more attractive to play, because she, it wasn't a perfect situation. You know what I find um, fascinating and astounding about news media, and I think it's become exponentially faster since 2004, was the well, speed sure. with which these, these yep. um, reports get put together. And if there's any um, misstep, perhaps it was rushing. Um, yes. But also, perhaps... But the movie conveys that. You, yes. you were on the air like you know six days after you were trying to start yes, the thing and, going. Yes, and there is a scene that, that, that Jamie wrote where you know there's an anal a post and analysis of the story and, and the damage control meeting with Burkett in which she says you know the documents were a small part of the story and you know because the I wasn't dotted the the piece was open to attack but also and as Dan was alluding to before perhaps there was you know um, a, a naive uh, assessment uh, which is, I think is completely understandable, of the, the toxicity of the political atmosphere at the time, which I think we take um, as, as the new normal, um, which perhaps had, you know, was, was un, they were in uncharted territory. And if mm -hmm. a story as controversial as this was going to be broken now, um, you know, and I'm speaking from a layperson's perspective, I would imagine that the spin doctors would be in there at the genesis of the story, not, you know, in the aftermath. You know, there'd be a plan A, B, C, D, um, whereas that was, that was only done as damage control in, in, in retrospect. Well, one scene that I didn't, I th thought I would expect to see in the movie, and I didn't see 
was Mr. Redford being attacked by the administration for past history uh, that Dan had with Republican, but particularly with the Bush family. And I wonder if that was not ever in the movie. Was that not ever considered? Because that was clearly part of the way they attacked the story, was that there was some sort of animus. Animus, and yeah. No, there was a definitely a by hook or by crook sort of way to attack it. It was, it was never in the film, and, and honestly, it was just a question of time. You know what I mean? It was, um, you know, the way we really wanted to approach it was to tell this story moment by moment and beat by beat, and not... Uh, as much as it was possible to not gild the lily and not not sort of you know paint paint certain people as villains throughout it because I don't think that that's the issue I don't think the issue is oh because this person has this job uh, the system didn't work I think mm -hmm. I think it's a larger you know if you want to sort of go there it's a larger systemic issue in terms of you know where our media is coming from now and how mm -hmm. we consume it. But also, I, I mean, I, I, I hope that the film is not merely a history lesson. Yeah. It's a provocation, you know, and, right. and, and that I think, you know, there were quite a few scenes that, or moments that, that in the, trying to get the thrust and the energy and the anxiety that, that existed around yeah. this particular issue at the time, you know, rhythmically, you want, you want to feel the audience that they're propelled on the same journey that Dan and, and Mary and the team were, and the, you know, and obviously CBS. And, and to do that, you know, certain details have to, have yeah. to go. And we always, I'm so sorry, just the, the, the other thing too is we always sort of talked about, we never wanted this movie to feel like homework. You know, I mean, because right. we've all sort of sat through those movies mm -hmm. where it's like, you're going to be lectured at for two hours. Mm -hmm. First and foremost, we wanted this to be thrilling and exciting and to mm -hmm. take you into the newsroom and, and to give you sort of what, what those highs feel like when you're on the trail of a story. You know, it's almost like a detective movie in, in, that, case, in, that, in mm -hmm. that regard. Is they're trying to piece it together. They're working, you know, around the clock to try and figure something out. And, and a big part of that was the speed and, and the propulsiveness. And, you know, we didn't want to sacrifice that, you know, to, to, to give you a history lesson. Well, Bill, one thing you mentioned earlier, you said we didn't do the story perfectly. And that's true. Yeah. Uh, we made mistakes. Uh, question, did you ever do a perfect story? No, it's, I don't think they really not, exist. But it, it, and then, well, I, I love so many things about this film because it explains journalism, how it works, how it really works, that we made mistakes and, and we left ourselves open to attack on the process. The, the attack centered on the process by which we got to the truth. Right. Mm -hmm. The truth, the, the facts were undeniable, therefore they attacked the process. And we were vulnerable because we, we made some mistakes in the process, but we, find, we ended up getting to the truth. The point here is, it's, this is the way journalism works. There's nothing scientific about journalism. And what you're seeking to do, you, you know you're going to make some mistakes. Now, obviously this is, well, I think without question, the darkest period of my own professional life. I would have much preferred they made a film about coverage of the civil rights movement or Watergate <laughs> right. or Vietnam or something. Right. But life's not like that, and they made the film here. But you make a good point that, yes, if we had been better, uh, I still think the attacks would have come, but, but we, we, would would have, have been, we would not would yeah. have been as vulnerable yeah. as we were. So, so CBS now has, says, uh, you know, uh, it's astounding how little truth there is in truth. Uh, it's full of distortions, evasions, and baseless conspiracy theories. <laughs> what are you expecting to send flowers? <laughs> but, <laughs> but, but, I'm, but I'm intrigued by what, what else, I mean, has CBS done anything else? To, first of all, did they do anything to try to block the movie? No. Okay, and have they done anything else? I know Kate was on with Colbert already, right? Didn't you appear with Colbert? Tonight. Again? tonight. Oh, it's tonight. Can I, yes. you know, Should back. I be worried? Too, too no. <laughs> I, think, I think it's intriguing, and that'll be interesting how he deals with it, but it wasn't like, oh, she can't be booked on a CBS show. But has, has CBS done anything else? Not that I know of. I mean, although, you know, I'm, I'm you know, the, the, day, the day is young, I guess. <laughs> no, but I've never, I never, they never reached out to me. They never, you know, I never had a conversation with them. You know, I mean, it's sort of as Bob says, you know, that, I don't think any of us were sitting around waiting for them to release a statement saying, first of all, thank you for making this film <laughs> right. and, and bringing this up again. We really appreciate but it. But even though it's very, very specific, and it's a very, about a very specific moment, um, yeah. as, as Dan said, you know, the intersection between media and politics and corporate America, um, it, 
I think it has a greater universality and the questions hopefully that the, the film asks are bigger than CBS, yeah. than Dan, than Mary. I think it's where have we come in the last 10 years. I mean, it was three years before the Twitter sphere, you know, that the, this these events took, took place. I think the way we digest and, um, and divulge information and, and perhaps the erosion of investigative journalism subsequent to this moment, I mean, they're, they're sort of interesting, bigger questions to ask beyond, you know, CBS. Well, you, if I may, just direct this to bring it around to you because Mr. Redford was in probably the greatest journalism movie of all time. Yes. And in that movie, <laughs> yes, indeed. And in all the president's men, similarly, journalists decided they had to take on the administration against long odds, against a lot of opposition. And in that movie, the journalists won. And in this movie, the journalists lose. Well, since you bring and I that wonder, up, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. since you bring that up, I, I think you make an interesting point, and that is the comparison, because this has come up a lot lately when we've been doing press for the film. Of course. The comparison between all the president's men and truth. And the comparison, even though there's a, the landscape has changed, as you know, and, and time has passed, time, time changes things. Um, the difference for me that I think the film illustrates is that these two guys, these two reporters for, for The Post, were, it's all about the work. And I think what this film shows, it's about the work. Mm -hmm. Their work was pretty intense, and they were going against great odds an administration that was very, very defensive, very paranoid, and was ready to blast them at any, any point. They were supported by their editor and the paper. Their boss supported them. In this case, the two reporters were not supported by their boss. Mm -hmm. and I, I think the film shows that. That's for an audience to take away, and I, I would hope that, I guess we all feel the same way, that what do we want an audience to do with this film, I think maybe it could provoke thought or conversation about journalism, journalism today and so forth. But if you can use that comparison, it stands pretty uh, stark. That how it was then and how it is now, when you don't have the support of your bosses, big yeah. difference. I think that is a, the big difference between the movie, that movie and this movie. But I also found one interesting thing that, I, that really struck me at the end of the movie, which I didn't know. And, and of course, in the, at the end of the movie, you're, you're go showing the, you know, the hearing that CBS set up. And if, that was not recorded, as I recall, right? There were, no, there were no transcripts of that, right, Dan? No, it was not. This was yep. the, and I'll put it in quotation marks, the independent, quote, unquote, right. um, commission that was appointed by the corporate entity of, of CBS uh, to investigate. But interestingly enough, that later, years later, in deposition for a lawsuit, uh, they, from the beginning, CBS instructed the panel, your job is not to find out the truth of what happened, it's to find out why the mistakes were made. Mm -hmm. But I, I think it's one of the more powerful scenes in the film when you see the film. It is. When Mary, alone, yes. isolated, vulnerable, she knows she's made some mistakes, but she knows the story is true, uh, faces this panel. Of, of lawyers whose job it is to destroy her. Right. And uh, if this is a great film, and I think it is a great film, that moment is one of the well, moments that make it that's so. That's exactly what I was going to ask, because it, she has an extraordinary speech where she says, OK, if you believe this, here's what had to have happened. And she, go, she ticks off all the things that would have had to have happened for this to, to have been set up as a fake. And I had not seen that or heard that explicated before. And I wonder, did that happen? Did she say that in the meeting? Because we don't have a transcript of that. Did, is that what she said? Is that how she delivered it? Because it's very powerful. She did. I mean, it, it, is, it is what she said. And, and um, you know, listen, it was a good gift to me as a filmmaker to, to, to have that. But, but that's, that's the way she put it. And I talked to more than one person who was in that room mm -hmm. um, who corroborated that. Yeah. And that, the performance by Kate, I'm sorry. That performance by Kate, I mean, Kate's performance was awesome, big first frame to last. But that performance where Mary, under attack, she knows what the verdict is going to be on her. The verdict was pre-cooked. When she makes, when she faces the panel and says to them, 
listen, to believe that this story is, that these documents, not the story, these documents are not what the report to me and ticks it off. I submit to you, you, you show me a better performance going all the way back to Carol Lombard, <laughs> whom, whom Kate reminds me of. This, this was a tremendous performance. It was the essence of Mary, and I can tell you, that's what she said. Mm -hmm. That was the scene inside that room, and Kate captured it, not just the essence, she captured the whole moment miraculously. What were you going to say, Kate, about it? I was just going to say, Mary, you know, you see, when, when you eventually see the film, as I hope you will, um, that there's a big black folder with a whole lot of tabs and documents, right. and Mary is um, nothing if not meticulous. And at the beginning, she has basically a prologue which outlines in a very dry, factual way, um, and I think very honestly uh, um, and truthfully, the series of events from Woe wo to Go. And that was a, um, a very, very useful document to sort of get inside the way she, the way she thought. It was very helpful counterpoint too to perhaps her memoir that was written after, the, um, after mm. she was not heard in Black Rock. Well, I'll agree with Dan, incredible performance by you. Uh, we're going to have questions from the audience. Uh, does anyone want to, oh, there's a mic right there. Uh, Mr. Redford, um, although I've spent most of my life here, my home is Big Sur. Oh, really? And my oldest, dearest friend was Margaret Wentworth Owings. Oh, for God's sake. And uh, as you know, Margaret lived for truth. Yes. And what Mr. Rather might call often uncomfortable truths. Right. May I ask you, sir, to speak about the influence Margaret had on your life and on your work? Well, you, you've touched on uh, Big Sur is one of my favorite areas in the world because of its mystical qualities and the fact that it hasn't been disturbed like other places have. It's very powerful. So I bought property there in 1990, which I still have. And I met Margaret Owings on an environmental conference. And she and I hit it off big time. And so we became friends. And I was with her two days before she died. And we had a conversation about death and about what you feel you've done in your life and was there anything left to do. And she said, no, I, it took me a while to move around to a place that I think I was always destined to go, and that is to talk about the value of keeping our environment untouched. Let nature stand alone. It'll take care of itself. So she stood for that, and that's how she and I came together. And we you know, went to the Owings house, because Nat built that house, you know. And so I, I, that memory will stick with me for the rest of my life, about the conversation we had, because it was a person who understood exactly that she wasn't going to be around much longer, but was so dignified and so willing to look back and try to find the best of things. That's my memory. We have another question right here. Hi, this is for Dan Rather, and I wonder what words you have for us about how the end consumer can ferret out news now. It's so difficult to actually get news. You know, instead of um, news from the White House, we're hearing about Michelle's fashion. Uh, instead of uh, news from overseas or what's going on in the Middle East, we're getting stories about the Kardashians. How do we get news in this environment? What's your best recommendation? Well, thank you very much for the question. Thank you. First is to recognize how greatly the environment has changed in all of journalism, but particularly in electronic journalism, uh, including the internet, television. You can get the news you need, but you have to work at it. So I think one is recognize it's not, as, it's not as easy. Quality news of integrity is not as accessible today as it once was, but there's some of it out there. Uh, investigative reporting has shrunk to what to me is a dangerous low level, but there is some investigative reporting out, but you have to work, that's number one. Number two, um, be sure you're skeptical. Not cynical, but skeptical. Great difference between cynicism and skepticism, of course. Reporters are, get paid to be skeptical, but never cynical. But so bring your skepticism and say, well, okay, this is what they're telling me on this channel. Let me look at some other channels. Or this is what they're telling me on this internet site. Let me go to some others. That's where the work comes out. Number three is to recognize that the environment has changed 
tremendously in this regard, and as a consumer, as a news consumer, you have to be aware of it. There was a time, and it hasn't been that long ago, that news, electronic news, particularly television news, was considered to be in the public service, that it was a public trust to be operated in the public service, that networks, including CBS, which was the world leader in this under Bill Paley's uh, leadership, was, look, we're in business to make money, but with news, news is a public service. We view it as a public trust. If we can make money with it, fine, but if not, well, we don't worry about it because it's our service, if you will. And as a news consumer to recognize that has disappeared. That has completely disappeared. And as when you see the film, there's a place in the film when, well, through Bob's tremendous acting ability, you know, Mary and I had a conversation about when and how it changed. Once 60 Minutes became a tremendous profit center for CBS, and it was the first to become a, we're talking about a major profit center, at that moment in time, things began to change. And as media consolidation went on in the years that followed, this idea of public trust and operating news as a, in the, as a public service uh, evaporated. And you need to be aware of that. All right, do we have another question? <coughs> yes, this gentleman. Good afternoon. It's a pleasure to be here with all five of you. Uh, my question is, as a young professional, um, what are your truths? What is the, do you have a philosophy that you independently live your lives by? <laughs> that's that's, that's no, a writer. wonderful question. I mean, I, I wish I, I yeah, I, 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 being the least interesting person up here, I'll answer quickly. <laughs> um, uh, uh, I, I'm just, uh, I, I just try and have a lot of gratitude. I mean, personally, I, I feel I'm so lucky to, to, to be able to do the thing I love for work, which is such a rare thing. And so I just, I try and be grateful in terms of that and the, and the people around me who I love. Kate, you got a thought um, on that? I guess I, I try and maintain my um, curiosity. But I like what, what Dan was saying about the difference between cynicism and skepticism. I might adopt that. <laughs> <laughs> what, what was the question? <laughs> <laughs> what, what, Personal what's your life, philosophy. Life, life philosophy. <laughs> um, well, I think... Why don't you ask first? I got to think about this, Dan. Why don't you? Ask? Well, 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 I long, long ago <laughs> made, made my peace with what happened with with CBS, and you know it, it happened ten years ago, and I'm long past that. But one of the things I took away from that experience was to ask myself the same question you've just asked me: that you know, what's at your core? What what is your ethos? And I've tried much harder, others will have to judge how successful, uh, to be into humility, modesty, gratitude, uh, and forgiveness, and mercy, and try to center, keep myself centered on those things, at the same time covering you know, frequently awful happenings, natural disasters, wars, really the underside of society that I think as a younger reporter, I didn't concentrate as much on those core values as I've been able to do in later years. Okay. Yes. Uh, <laughs> he's, it took me a while to, to wrap my mind around what you were saying. Uh, I, I would say that the thing that it interests me is the country that I grew up in and live in. And when I had, I'm interested in, in that country. And when I got older, and became an artist and then a, and went into film, I decided I wanted to tell stories about the country I grew up in and how it changed and how I changed along with it. So because I grew up at a time <clears throat> at, towards the end of the Second World War, there was a lot of red, white, and blue propaganda about how great we were. We were great. We are a great country. But as time went on, when somebody told me, because I was in sports, somebody said, well, it doesn't matter whether you win or lose, but how you play the game. And being in sports, I found out that was a lie, mm -hmm. that everything mattered as to whether you won or not. And so I decided years later, I want to make films about the truth about this country, which is really more in a gray area. There was a gray zone below all the red, white, and blue propagandic stuff. 
And the gray zone was where life was more complex. And I got interested in that, and I wanted to tell stories from that area where it's more complicated. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's my answer to your question. I committed myself to that. That's a fantastic way to wrap this up. I want to thank this incredible panel for this amazing performance. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Dan. Excellent.